Good morning. My name is Steve Cordes, and I'm chair of the Board of Visitors of the Albert Dorman Honors College and national co-chair of NJIT Next. And I'll be your master of ceremony for today. And today we have the inauguration of Dr. Joel Stewart Bloom as the eighth president of New Jersey Institute of Technology. Ladies and gentlemen, the procession is led by the Grand Marshal of New Jersey Institute of Technology, Dean of Students, Dr. Jack Gentle. Ladies and gentlemen, now entering are the flags of the 105 home countries of NJIT students. Albania, Latvia, Argentina, Lebanon, Australia, Liberia, Bangladesh, Libya, Belarus, Macedonia, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Malaysia, Botswana, Mauritania, Brazil, Mauritius, Bulgaria, Mexico, Burkina Faso, Morocco, Cameroon, Nepal, Canada, New Zealand, Cape Verde. Chad, Nigeria, China, Norway, Colombia, Congo, Panama, Costa Rica, Peru, Cote d'Ivoire, Croatia, Poland, Cuba, Portugal, Cyprus, Republic of Korea, Czech Republic, Romania, Denmark, Russia, Dominica, Rwanda, Dominican Republic, Saudi Arabia, Ecuador, Senegal, Egypt, Serbia, El Salvador, Sierra Leone, Ethiopia, Singapore, Finland, Slovakia, France, Slovenia, Gambia, Spain, Germany, Sri Lanka, Ghana, Sudan, Greece, Sweden, Guatemala, Syria, Guyana, Taiwan, Haiti, Tajikistan, Honduras, Tanzania, India, Thailand, Iran, Trinidad and Tobago, Ireland, Turkey, Israel, Uganda, Italy, Ukraine, Jamaica, Uruguay, Japan, Venezuela, Jordan, Vietnam, Kenya, Democratic Republic of Congo, Korea, Zimbabwe, Kuwait, Kyrgyzstan, United States of America.
entering are representatives from other universities and colleges in the order of their founding, from oldest to newest. Beginning in 1740, Gary Service from the University of Pennsylvania, James Gardner, Columbia University Teachers College, Chancellor Philip L. Yeagle, Rutgers, the State University of New Jersey, Newark campus, Thomas N. Farris, Rutgers, the State University of New Jersey. Richard L. Tomasetti, New York University. President Kathleen Waldron, William Patterson University. David A. DeBrigida, Lehigh University. Nancy Paffendorf, Centenary College. Robert Reddy, Drew University. Sanchoy K. Das, Virginia Polytechnic Institute and State University. Jerome H. Solomon, Temple University. John W. Seesholz, NJIT Class of 59, Georgian Court University. President Susan A. Cole, Montclair State University. Taraji Williams Murray, Long Island University. President Sue Henderson, New Jersey City University. President Paul G. Gaffney, Monmouth University. President Margaret M. McManaman, Union County College. Charles T. Rooney, Felician College. President Edward J. Yaw, County College of Morris. Terrence Hardy, Cumberland County Community College. Gail Gibson, Essex County College. President Raymond Yanuzzi, Camden County College. President Stephen Rose, Passaic County Community College. President Peter P. Mercer, Ramapo College of New Jersey. President Denise Rogers, University of Medicine and Dentistry of New Jersey. William J. Seaton, Thomas Edison State College. New Jersey Institute of Technology's roots date back to 1881. Entering now are the gonfalons of the six NJIT colleges. The New Jersey College of, excuse me, the Newark College of Engineering founded in 1919. The College of Architecture and Design established in 1973. The College of Science and Liberal Arts established in 1982. The School of Management, founded in 1988. The Albert Dorman Honors College, created in 1994. The College of Computing Sciences, begun in 2001. Now entering are the Associate Vice Presidents of the University. Join me now in welcoming the members of the NJIT faculty, led by members of the Faculty Council. Dr. Priscilla Nelson is chair of the Faculty Council.
please now welcome the speakers representing the NJIT student body, NJIT alumni, university staff, university faculty, and university administration. Next in procession is Renee Karp, religious educator and scholar and sister of Dr. Bloom. Welcome now the provost of NJIT, Dr. Ian Gately, followed by the academic deans. The deans are followed by university officers and the president's cabinet. Now entering is the NJIT Board of Overseers and the NJIT Board of Trustees. Welcome now, former New Jersey Governor Thomas Kane, a former ex officio member of the Board of Trustees, and ex officio member of the Board, Newark Mayor Cory Booker. Ladies and gentlemen, led by the Carney Caledonian Pipe Band is Dr. Joel Stewart Bloom, 8th President of New Jersey Institute of Technology.
Good morning. It is my great pleasure and privilege to welcome you to the installation ceremony of Dr. Joel Stewart Bloom as the eighth president of New Jersey Institute of Technology. And it is also my privilege to ask you to turn off your mobile devices and cell phones. Now please stand for the posting of the colors and the national anthem. The colors are posted by members of the color guard from our Air Force ROTC Detachment 490 headquartered at NJIT. The national anthem will be sung by members of the Newark Boys Choir. Please remain standing after the national anthem for the invocation given by Renee Karp, sister of Dr. Bloom.
What a point of personal pride it is for me to be able to deliver, to deliver this invocation this morning. The month of September is, in many aspects, a time of new beginnings. Children begin or return to school. Young adults begin or return to universities. And the fall season is soon upon us. Today, for the 131-year-old New Jersey Institute of Technology, there is also a new beginning. Today, NJIT is inaugurating its eighth president, continuing a journey that began in 1881. Today, we thank the creator of all for the privilege of witnessing this historic occasion we are grateful for the imagination and vision that inspired the founders of this great university. Dear God, we ask for blessings upon this new president and all those associated with him in the sacred trust of leadership. Together, they will move that vision forward as they lead May they be imbued with wisdom, prudence, and strength, and be guided by the principles that nourished those founders in 1881. We are mindful that this is an institution entrusted with our future. There are almost 10,000 graduate and undergraduate students who are already on a path prepared to impact the worlds they will inherit they will make that vision real. There is a whisper of the divine in the human commitments of those who teach and continue to reach, sustaining the inspiration that makes the imagination real. We are graced by those who support this university. They open the doors and the windows that enable that foothold into the future they are truly partners in the world to come. And so in this moment of new beginnings, our hearts beat with a cadence of pride as we give thanks for the courage and creative spirit that inhabits this place. Thank you, creator of all, for the light in this world and for our sustained hope for the future. Count us as blessed, and let us all say, Amen. Thank you, Ms. Carr. Please be seated. On behalf of the entire community of New Jersey Institute of Technology, I'm honored to greet our many distinguished guests. From far and wide, we have gathered in commemoration of this grand occasion in the life of our university, the inauguration of the eighth president of New Jersey Institute of Technology, Dr. Joel Stewart Bloom. Besides the distinguished guests who joined the procession, it is my pleasure to welcome a few others. The Honorable Carol Y. Clark, Essex County Board of Chosen Freeholders, District 3. Dr. Crystal Smith, President, National Association of Multicultural Engineering Program Advocates, Inc. Ms. Michelle Lizama, CEO 
the National Consortium for Graduate Degrees for Minorities in Engineering and Science, Inc. Michael W. Klein, Esquire, CEO of New Jersey State's Colleges and Universities. Arcelia Laponte, President, New Jersey Board of Education. Cami Anderson, State, excuse me, State District Superintendent, Newark Public Schools. Mr. Chip Halleck, President and CEO, Newark Regional Business Partnership. The Honorable Carlos M. Gonzalez, Council Member at Large, Newark Municipal Council. The Honorable Darren Sharif, Council Member at Large, Newark Municipal Council. The Honorable Mildred C. Crump, Council Member at Large, Newark Municipal Council. The Honorable Jennifer Beck, Senator, District 11. The Honorable Loretta Weinberg, Senator, District 37. The Honorable M. Teresa Ruiz, Senator, District 29. The Honorable Paul A. Sarlo, Senator, District 36. The Honorable Sandra Bolden Cunningham, Senator, District 31. The Honorable Shavonda E. Sumter, Assemblywoman, District 35. The Honorable Thomas P. Giblin, Assemblyman, District 34. The Honorable Albert Cotino, Assemblyman, District 29. I'd also recognize, I'd like to recognize a very special friend of the university, Al Dorman, who's known six of the eight NJIT presidents and who was a driving force behind the creation in 1994 of the Albert Dorman Honors College. Al, are you here? <laughs> yes, you are. I should have known that Al always has my back. <clears throat> now it is my great privilege to introduce Thomas H. Kane, former governor of the state of New Jersey. Thomas Howard Kane served two terms as governor of New Jersey from January 1982 to January 1990. A graduate of Princeton, he, like Dr. Bloom, is an alumnus of Teachers College at Columbia University. And like Dr. Bloom, he knows what it is to lead a university, having served as president of Drew University for 15 years after leaving office in 1990. As a former teacher, education policy was of special importance to Governor Kane, a commitment he shares with Dr. Bloom. Before joining NJIT, Dr. Bloom worked with the governor as an assistant commissioner for education, responsible for statewide assessment, curriculum standards, math, science, technology education, and improving ur urban education through piloting the effective schools research and alternative education programs. Following the report, A Nation at Risk, which warned of the growing threat the US faced if the quality of education continued to decline, Governor Kane worked tirelessly for education reform in our state, earning him a national reputation Governor Kane also addressed educational issues on the national level. He has served as chairman of the Education Commission of the States, a forum that allowed governors, legislature, legislators, educators, and others to discuss and evaluate programs across the country. More recently, Governor Kane headed the task force for strengthening higher education in New Jersey. This week, and all weeks. We acknowledge his key role as chairman of the National Commission on Terrorist Act Attacks Upon the United States, widely known as the 9-11 Commission. Governor Kane. Thank you very, very much. Mayor Booker. President Bloom, and all of you from the NJIT family. It is an honor for me to be here today. <clears throat> that was a nice introduction, but introductions worry me a bit because innovation and technology reminds me of a story I heard once about Thomas Edison. And he was introduced once at a dinner. And his introduction went on and on and on and on. 
And it finished with him saying, with the introducer saying, and now I will introduce the person who invented the talking machine. <laughs> and Edison got up and said, no, you're wrong. I didn't invent the talking machine. I only invented the first one that could be shut off. <laughs> At any rate, it's wonderful to be here because you represent so much that's important to our state, to our city, to our country. Uh, I had great pleasure this summer of walking around this campus and seeing the improvements and seeing the things that had happened here. And of course, my escort was Dr. Bloom. And to understand his pride, his pride in the history of this place, his pride in this faculty and the wonderful people it has on it, his pride in the diversity and accomplishments of the student body, and his dreams for the future, as great as this place has been, he knows that you can get even better. So I learned so much, and I'll tell you something. What I used to say, NJIT and Dr. Bloom are just perfect together. <laughs> now, I know we've got a world of problems out there, and you do too. We're in the middle of a terrible recession. We've got uh, problems with our debt in this state and in this nation. We've got a growing inequality among our people. We're approaching a fiscal cliff. There is an incivility in our public life which troubles us and troubles us terribly. You, you know the Pew Research, I don't know if you saw it, you know the, the gap now in values between Republicans and Democrats, according to Pew, is greater than the gap between blacks and whites, between rich and poor, between men and women, between even the classes. And that's very difficult, very difficult to solve any of these problems with that kind of gap. Uh, and Above it all is this feeling in the country right now, as shown in polls, first time in our history, parents are worried that their children are not going to have as good a life as they did. But, you know, we've always believed in this country that we could change the future. And in the past, we have. In the 20th century, we created the most prosperous society in the world in history. We did it through education. We did it through innovation. The first part of the century, huge increase in the high schools, and the number and quality. Second half of the century, great increase in higher education, and the same thing. We created a workforce with high skills and opportunity, and out of that we produced tremendous income and a wonderful life for people in this country. Scientific project drove innovation, and that drove growth. So average income in that period increased, by the way, sevenfold. And the government did a number of things. National Science Foundation, the GI Bill, uh, after uh, investment in science, after Sputnik, the Fulbrights, the community colleges, the federal loan programs, the Pell Grants, all of this done by people who weren't necessarily thinking of the present, but thinking of the future. And what kind of a place if you invested in higher education this country could become? Education and in science and technology have been key to our global success. Now, once again, we've got to do it all over again. Now, more than ever before, we've got to invest in science, invest in technology, to understand that if we don't do this, we're not going to be able to compete in this world. Other people are now copying us around the world. We've got to do even more if we're going to stay ahead of them. We've got to do, I think, certain things if we're going to create this knowledge-based society that we all need. First of all, on the federal level, we've got to continue to invest in science and technology and research. We've got to create a national core of 100,000 trained, what we call STEM teachers, that's teachers trained in science, technology, engineering, and math. And by the way, that's underway, the training of these teachers, these teachers already. 
We've got to take people who come to this country and study here in places like NJIT, come from other places to learn, and if they learn and if they get PhDs and if they want to stay in this country, they should get green cards immediately. We, we, we need their skills. And in New Jersey here, we've got to continue to invest in higher education. And by the higher education bond issue, it's very important. It's going to be in a ballot this fall. Make sure you vote for it and get your friends to, too. <clears throat> Look, we got a lot of problems. We all know that. But we've had these problems before. We divided as a country. When were we most divided? During the Civil War. You know what happened during the Civil War? You know what Abraham Lincoln did in the middle of that war? He signed the Morrill Act. What was that? Creating the land-grant colleges, which are now the backbone of our system of higher education. He did that in the middle of the Civil War. He created a National Academy of Science in the middle of the Civil War. He had the vision, Lincoln did, to look beyond that war and see what you had to invest in to make this a great country, and to keep this nation competitive in every way. This was, the question is, whether we have Lincoln's vision, and we have Lincoln's foresight, and Lincoln's understanding, and Lincoln's courage to look beyond today and invest in what's tomorrow. We, should, we, are, we are divided on a number of things. We should never be divided on what we can do to make sure this nation and our children have the best possible future. I'll tell you one final Lincoln story. Because his cabinet, people used to come in, and things were happening all the time around them. There were crises, many, many crises every day. I mean, anybody leaders that, Matt Booker goes through that, so does the governor, so does the president. Crises all the time around you. Lincoln told a story, because Lincoln was a teller of parables. And he said, you know, one time I came in this young man, it was a stormy night in the field, and all of a sudden there was this shower of meteorites. And the young man had never seen this. He was scared to death. And he fell down. He's crying. And I said, I put his hand on his shoulder, and I said, you know, you see those meteorites? Look beyond them. Look up to the fixed sky. Look up to the fixed stars. Because on those fixed stars, you can set your course. There are still fixed stars. There is still Lincoln vision. And we still have a lot to do. But I'll tell you, this is where it's happening. You at NJIT are doing it. You are the ones who are going to create this knowledge-based society. You are the ones who have the incubator companies here that are going to create the jobs of the future. With your past, with the vision that Joel has for this great university, this great school, uh, I'm not worried. I think you're going to have a very bright future. And because of you, we're all going to have a better future. Thank you, and congratulations, sir. Thank you very much, Governor Kane. To add further luster to our celebration, we are honored by the President, excuse me, by the President's, a little premature, Mayor. <laughs> we are honored by the presence of the Mayor of our city, the Honorable Cory Booker. The Honorable Cory A. Booker took the oath of office as mayor of New Jersey's largest city on July 1, 2006, following a sweeping electoral victory. He is just the third person to govern Newark since 1970. Booker's passion for politics and justice was instilled at an early age by a family committed to change. Cory Booker's political career began in 1998 after serving as staff attorney for the Urban Justice Center in Newark. He rose to prominence as Newark's Central Ward Councilman. During his four years of service from 1998 to 2002, then Councilman Booker earned a reputation as a leader with innovative ideas and bold actions. 
from increasing security in public housing to building new playgrounds. This work was the foundation for his leadership as mayor. Reflecting his commitment to education, Booker is a member of numerous boards and advisory committees, including Democrats for Education Reform, Columbia University, Teachers College Board of Trustees, and the Black Alliance for Educational Options. He received his BA and MA from Stanford University, a BA in Modern History at Oxford University as a Rhodes Scholar, and completed his law degree at Yale. In recognition of his outstanding career in public service, NJIT conferred the, conferred the degree of Doctor of Humane Letters, honoris causa, upon Booker at the 2009 commencement ceremony. Mayor Booker. Good afternoon, everyone. If you will allow me uh, first uh, to be uh, just bask in this moment and having the privilege to stand here before you, to stand with the Honorable Governor Keene and with the new president, uh, I find myself wanting to lean upon the words of my elders. And I'd like to just simply give three simple sets of words, one about this university, one about the esteemed president we recognize today, and then the third group of words about the future. The first set of words is very simple. My mom is an extraordinary lady. And now I always hold my breath because when some errant reporter runs to her to ask her about the exploits of her son, she always has a way of leading off with her remarks that are appropriate for this day. She'll look that reporter or that party of interest in the eye after they pepper her with questions about me and what I may have done or not done. And she'll cross her arms and say, you know, behind every successful child is an astonished parent. <laughs> this university, this great institution, is astonishing. Those who gave birth to it I'm not even sure if they could see the truth that it would be exhibiting in this modern era. The story of this great institution is radiant reading, written in the pen of providence, clutched in the hand of indomitable will. It has touched this city in profound ways, our state, our nation, and the globe. It's creating a status of education that is the envy of points all across the world. And I have to say, as the mayor of this great city, that what this institution does for Newark is not simply astonishing, but truly awesome. It is a partner with us in progress and transformation and change. It has stood with this great city through the greatest of days. And it has stood with us in dark days, not like other universities in other cities that just set thought to make a bunker, to build walls. This institution was always looking for ways to build bridges, to connect itself, to be a force of empowerment. There are so many aspects of this university that speak to that, from the development projects we are planning together now to even New Jersey's oldest and longest standing business incubator that has businesses that are on the front lines of technology and are producing revenues of tens of millions of dollars. I stand today in a sense of awesome gratitude as one astonished young man who feels at his heart of hearts a sense of celebration for what this university is. The second story or words are about the man we note today. I have had the privilege of knowing him for some time now, and in my conversations, he makes me want to give him, perhaps from an executive to an executive, a small little warning of sorts. You see, there is something that is said that presidents of universities have in common with presidents of cemeteries. <laughs> that both individuals have many people underneath them but none of them are listening. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
President Bloom, you have, like I have often, the perception of power, but the paucity of it. Yet you are the man for the job. You today in this inauguration ceremony make formal what is already fact. Leadership is not a title, it is a way of being. This president is a leader. He's not one that just can put his levers on the formal mechanisms of power. He does not just lead with his great capacity as a manager. He does not just lead with his technical understanding, but he leads with a moral authority, with someone who comes to the job with a firm moral compass, who comes to the job with a moral imagination for what this university and what our city and state and nation and globe can be. Indeed, I tell you right now, I believe our country is starving for leadership, for people who have the courage to tell the truth, who have the courage to challenge, who have the determination to push, and who have the love in their hearts that consistently opens their minds and their arms to embrace the ideas, the diversity, and indeed, all of the people underneath them. Finally, about the future. I have a great dad who uh, stories I always lean forward, even though I've heard the same ones now for some 43 years, I enjoy listening to them because while my mom has a penchant for accuracy, my dad has the gift of exaggeration. <laughs> His stories get more colorful the more he tells them and his childhood gets more dramatic. He was uh, first born poor, now he will fight with you and said, I wasn't born poor, I was PO, P-O, I couldn't afford the other two letters. <laughs> well, being the PO Southern boy, he has a lot of Southern stories. This is one of my favorite. He used it as a time that he wanted me to get up and do something, and he told me the story about a country man that was sitting in his rocking chair next to a hound dog, and the hound dog was just howling away, sounded like it was in an awful pain. And a man finally strolled by and looked at the man and said, what's wrong with your hound dog? And he said, well, he's howling like that because he's sitting on a nail. And the man looked at the hound dog and looked back at the man and said, that seems strange. Why doesn't he just get up and move? And the man said, well, shucks. He's just not hurting enough yet. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I hear a lot of howling more and more in our public discourse. A lot of barking and yelling and accusations. I, I think that sometimes our country is being affected by that worst of all strains of what I call sedentary agitation. Where we're so upset about what's going on and so willing to yell about it, but not willing to get up and do something about it. To me, if I can leave you with final words about this awesome institution, about this great leader, it really is to challenge us all that today we need leaders, institutions, and individuals that will recognize the pain that is afflicting the heart of this democracy, recognizing the need that we have to get up and move forward to not scream an accusational tone, but to give a chorus of conviction that is uniting to our body politic. We have challenges before us. And what excites me is that this institution is at the center of what can be a source of profound solutions. It's worrisome to me when I see an economy that's being marked by stratifications of income, an economy that's not producing the talent needed to fuel it forward. I worry that a nation with just miles from here that celebrates a statue of liberty that reached out to around this globe, inviting huddled masses to our shores, now brings in the best minds into our institutions of higher learning. And as soon as they finish their educational study, we're quick to try to kick them out of our country and send them on their way and deny them the visas that they need to contribute to the growing American story. We have challenges, challenges that are just yards away from this great institution, challenges that must be met. This institution, more than ever in its history, it is time 
for us to double down. I'm so proud that the Board of Trustees of this university, its faculty and staff, are so involved in our city. But we now must conceive even bolder dreams for what we can be as a nation, because the urgency is here. We must make true on our calling of our founders. We must make this a more perfect union and provide for every single American liberty and justice. That is our calling. And I know that that call will be answered by a mighty university in a great city called Newark. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mayor Booker. I know you have a scheduled engagement, so at some point you may go up and leave. So thank you, though, very much for your comments. <clears throat> I'm now pleased to introduce Rochelle Hendricks. Uh, as New Jersey's first Secretary of Higher Education, Secretary Hendricks has more than 20 years of experience working on education issues in the Garden State. Appointed to the cabinet-level post by Governor Chris Christie in May, she had served previously as Acting Commissioner of New Jersey's Department of Education. Prior to that assignment, Hendricks had served in the Department of Education as Assistant Commissioner for the Division of School Effectiveness and Choice, overseeing key reform initiatives and areas. Hendricks has also uh, served in the Department of Education in various other capacities. Prior to joining the staff, at the Department of Education. She worked for over 15 years at Princeton in numerous capacities, including Assistant Dean of Students, Director of Educational Opportunities Program, and Interim Director of the Women's Program. Uh, Secretary Hendricks. First of all, let me say how pleased I am to be here on behalf of Governor Christie, and I would dare say the higher education community as a whole. Uh, to uh, Governor Kane, who has long been one of my heroes, I think he knows that, uh, and I see him as a model for public service and how to get it right. Uh, so I'm privileged to be on the stage with you again, sir. And to Mayor Booker, who uh, has challenged us and sort of called up the best in us and reminded us, the two of them together, of who we are as a people and as a nation and the challenges we have ahead of us in higher education. To my colleague and dear friend, President Joel Bloom. President Joel Bloom, what an honor and a privilege it is to be here for your inauguration as the eighth president of NJIT, this extraordinary institution. I'm going to be brief, and since uh, the two speakers before me have laid down the gauntlet, and I'm trusting that you are not in the cemetery, that you are looking to the North Star, and you have the good sense to get up if the nail is beginning to stick you in an uncomfortable place. So I'm going to give a slightly different twist um, and be uh, somewhat brief, and if I stick to my notes, I will definitely be. If I don't, we may be in trouble. It is a daunting complex and wonderfully exciting time to be part of higher education, and especially here in New Jersey. You've heard about how critical it is for us to do the extraordinary thing, the amazing, and I know that in New Jersey we can because we, we've done it, quite frankly, with very little support for about two decades now. But the good news is, is the current administration has made higher education a priority. And there are some telltale signs, some of the recent landmark legislation, including the restructuring of medical education in the state of New Jersey, the $750 million bond referendum, and as Governor Kane said, get out and vote, vote, and tell everybody else you know, vote, vote, and by the way, vote yes. In addition to that, there's the enactment of multiple pieces of legislation to support public-private partnerships to also help address the infrastructure needs of our colleges and universities. And we're also pleased that we've managed to provide some increases in the overall budget, and particularly in the case of student support. In a knowledge economy, 
Education is, in fact, the new currency by which nations maintain economic competitiveness and prosperity. I propose that we have an unprecedented opportunity, because when there's unprecedented challenges, there's unprecedented opportunity, to do things dramatically better, but also dramatically different. In fact, I dare say we have a moral, social, and economic imperative to do so. Together, all of higher education, and particularly NJIT, I say to you, we have a unique opportunity to transform our education system in ways that will resonate for decades to come, and perhaps in ways we have never dared to think of previously. As we seek, from the state level, new partnerships with industry, as we strengthen the ties between higher education and the economy of our state, I cannot think of a better partner in this effort than Dr. Bloom and NJIT. And he's already evidenced that consistently during the period of time that I've been in office and that he's been in office. It's been a pretty exciting first year for me and I think quite an awesome year for you, my friend. Dr. Bloom is an innovator, He's a visionary leader with deep experience, boundless energy, and enthusiasm. I would also describe him as the leader of the three Ps, perspicacity, principle, and passion. And I should add a fourth, now that I think about it, persistence. More than two decades ago, when both of us worked in the Department of Education during the Kane era, Dr. Bloom demonstrated his commitment then to ensuring the highest quality of education for all students, regardless of background. He was committed then and he's committed now to not just beating the odds that stand in the way of progress, but changing the odds so that everybody can benefit. Today, as president of NJIT, his responsibilities have grown exponentially since those first years we met at the Department of Ed. He now leads an institution that is receiving national recognition as a leader in research. With its multifaceted mission of education, research, service, and economic development, NJIT is well positioned to play a lead role in meeting the emerging needs of our state and our nation. The university's research program is already among the fastest growing in the country it ranks among the top 10 technological universities for research expenditure. The university's community outreach and economic development programs include, and you've heard both Governor Kane and Mayor Booker reference the Enterprise Development Center, New Jersey's first and the largest small business incubator, one of the top 25 in the nation, focusing on high technology companies and minority owned businesses. Further, NJIT, these are bragging rights, I like to brag about our institution, ranked in the nation's top tier of national research universities according to the U.S. News and World Report's 2011 Annual Guide to America's Best Colleges. And just to make sure that everybody knows that's here today, Bloomberg Business Week survey of U.S. colleges ranked NJIT in the top 10% nationally for return on investment and classify the university as one of four higher education best buys in our state. And I dare say to MIT, move over. NJIT is coming through. The value and importance of NJIT's role in our state's economic future cannot be underestimated or overstated. As we move forward in partnership to retool and rebuild New Jersey's economy, I know that I can count on Dr. Bloom and the NJIT family to help us advance the cause. For Dr. Bloom has consistently demonstrated bold and creative ideas, and just as importantly, a thoughtful and thorough implementation of the same. He is a caring and committed person who demonstrates consistently respect for all that he has the pleasure of working with and all of us who have the pleasure of working with him. I thank him in advance for continuing that level of full engagement in the city of Newark, in the state of New Jersey, and in our nation as we work together towards real 
lasting reform. To my friend and colleague of more than 25 years, I say congratulations, and we've got a lot of work to do, and we're going to do it together. And to this Board of Trustees, I thank you for the wisdom that you've demonstrated in selecting Joel to lead this institution in this century at this time. And to the entire NJIT family and friends, let's do the impossible, because together we can do it. And I will leave you with this quote. There is uh, an old proverb that says, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Let's go together. Thank you, Secretary Hendricks. Today, we are also honored to have with us the Honorable Donald M. Payne, Jr., Newark Municipal Council President and Essex County Council President. He is a lifelong Newark resident whose family has dedicated themselves to making government work for people. His public service follows that of his respected uncle, William Payne, a former assemblyman, and his father, the esteemed Congressman Donald M. Payne, Sr., who served the good people of New Jersey's 10th District from 1989 until his untimely death in March of this year. Mr. Payne has proudly served for 20 years as a district leader in Newark's South Ward and for six years as a freeholder at large for Essex County, where he is pleased to be the county's top vote getter. His expertise and knowledge of government at all levels has brought crucial continuity for the businesses and people of Essex County and Newark, minimizing bureaucratic red tape so business gets done, jobs get created, and services get delivered to people who need them. These skills help Mr. Payne play an instrumental role in the deal to bring Panasonic's American headquarters to Newark, delivering nearly 1,000 permanent jobs. Throughout his career, Mr. Payne has effectively championed the progressive values and causes that affect people most. A tireless advocate for schools and kids, he has led the fight year after year for education funding, and he has assisted countless area preschools. He co-founded Embracing Arms, which prepares young people for future leadership and established Above the Rim, a program that fosters scholarship and athletics. As freeholder, he partnered with Essex County College to create a job training program with college credit for area students in the growing hospitality industry. Mr. Payne. Well, thank you and good afternoon. It's a real honor and a privilege to stand here before you today in the capacity as the president of the Newark Municipal Council on such an auspicious occasion. Uh, as it was stated by Ms. Hendricks, I believe that the Board of Trustees has made a wise decision in allowing Dr. Bloom to uh, take the leadership of this beautiful institution. I, uh, you know, was uh, pretty touched by the remarks by the articulator in chief from the city of Newark. I'm sorry he had to leave, but uh, you never know if you want to go up before him or follow him. Uh, today would have probably been a day to go before him. <laughs> but uh, I was a bit late, uh, Dr. Bloom, and I apologize. Yeah. But I would have been a little earlier. A young lady stopped me outside, and she was leaving, and she says, Oh, thank God you got here. I was like, really? She said, yes, I came to hear you speak. OK. Uh, she says, no, no, I heard you last week, and you were incredible. So now I'm starting to feel a little good about myself. I said, oh, really? I said, well, what, what was the topic? She said, I don't know, but you were brief. <laughs> so, so in that vein, I'll be brief. This institution as it was stated, being a, a child of Newark all my life, never living anywhere else, living on the same block, same street all my life, means a great deal to us in the city of Newark. 
the old Newark College of Engineering, where my cousin David Stanley in the late 60s uh, attended, and also uh, my cousin, the former Assemblyman Craig Stanley, who is also part of that legacy, uh, is here now as part of the faculty, and we're very proud of that. This school means a great deal to us in the city of Newark. And its growing prominence around the nation is something that gives a boy from Newark a great deal of pride. You know, any time in the past when an institution or a body changed its name from Newark to New Jersey, we really kind of count the days and years before they move. But NJIT has steadfast stayed here and grown into an institution that we can be proud of. And I'm sure Dr. Bloom will move it forward with his vision and his ideas in the same continuity that has been done in the past. So I'm just here to say thank you for the continued uh, efforts by this institution to include youngsters of diverse backgrounds, which is very important to us here in Newark. So as a Newark Municipal Councilman, I have tried to do what I can to support this institution. And I'm looking forward to having an inauguration myself, if I'm lucky, on November 5th. Uh, so I'm, I'm watching how you doing this. But uh, <laughs> On the federal level, I will continue my support for institutions of higher learning that fall inside the 10th Congressional District of the State of New Jersey. Thank you very much. Congratulations, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Payne. We will now hear from speakers representing the NJIT community. We begin with Jonathan A. Weiss, president of the NJIT Student Senate, representing the student body. Jonathan. Welcome, everyone. It was pointed out to me, and I have to take it into consideration, that this is actually a, a giant privilege on the fact that not many students while at college get to see the inauguration of a new president at their institution. So for all the students out there, you should really take that into consideration that this is a once in a lifetime uh, opportunity that we get today. So on behalf of the students, I would like to congratulate Dr. Bloom on this momentum occasion. It's a real pleasure having a president that we had a chance to actually work with here at the institution and understands his students so well. As the, pre as the Vice President of Academic and Student Affairs and the Dean of the Otters College, he's taken the time to get to know the student body and work with people individually. He takes a chance to help foster students' involvement on campus and encourages students to share their opinions on how to improve student life here. If anybody is still curious of how he's done this, he has already implicated 30, he's already hired 30 new tenured faculty and is in the process of hiring more. He has also invested into new staff to assist in student life here on campus. With these new hirings, departments at school can grow into the ideal that NJIT is becoming. He also helps foster Greek life here at school by supporting the Greek village that is being built, the Warren Street Village, which is being built over in lot, uh, the old Lot 16. Most schools are pushing away their Greek life, but here we are fostering them and helping them grow into better, more sustainable organizations. He also has taken the time to visit and talk to students about their concerns this semester, such as the continued work being done on the Central King Building, which was supposed to be finished up over the summer, but ran into some issues. He also is a large advocate 
in bringing more funding to our university to assist in the building of more, in the constructions of more buildings and advancing academics. It can be seen that President Bloom is moving the edge in the direction that enhances the student experience. I'd like to say congratulations once more, and it will be a pleasure to work with Dr. Bloom throughout his time here as president. Thank you very much. We're now going to hear from Joseph A. Stanley, president of the NJIT Alumni, Asso Alumni Association, representing the uh, NJIT alumni. Joe. Governor Kane, Councilman Payne, members of the boards of trustees and overseers, faculty, students, honored guests, and especially Dr. Bloom and your family. I am privileged to bring a bit of the alumni perspective to the inauguration of Dr. Joel Stewart Bloom and why I'm convinced that he is the best man for the job. Having had the privilege of spending some time in the trustees boardroom and seeing the relatively few portraits of past presidents over the course of the university's more than 130 years of history, it is clear that the inauguration of only our eighth president is truly a significant event. However, I must confess that the magnitude of such festivities has not always been so clear to me. I was an undergraduate at the time of the inauguration of Dr. Saul Fenster, our sixth president. Being a student, just trying to concentrate on achieving my degree, I viewed the occasion as almost a non-event. As far as I was concerned, Dr. Fenster was just going to be a different person who would be collecting my tuition. <laughs> Admittedly, this was a very narrow perspective on my part. As time went on, it was abundantly evident that the president of the university, especially one who has a clear vision and qualities of leadership, can and does have a significant impact on the university and the values of our degrees. Without a doubt, Dr. Fenster was one of the best expanding the university and raising the national profile. Not coincidentally, Dr. Fenster also served as a valued mentor to Joel Bloom. Joel was the Dean of Honors College during my initial tenure on the alumni board. While I knew who he was and our paths casually crossed, I didn't have an opportunity to really know him. You have to understand the terms Honors College and Joe Stanley have seldom shared the same sentence. <laughs> I did recognize his accomplish accomplishments in the position of founding dean were nothing short of legendary. Spearheading a significant fundraising campaign and raising the profile of the college with the attraction of many truly gifted students. While this experience alone might be an important enough qualification in many people's minds to justify Joel being named as president of NGIT, from my perspective, it is not the most important. When Joel was originally named president by the Board of Trustees after Bob Oltenkirk left for the University of Alabama at Huntsville, I asked him to meet with him alone to discuss how the Alumni Association might be able to work with his administration. While it was certainly an extremely hectic time for him, he still quickly set up a breakfast meeting. During that meeting, it was clear that he had a vision and an ability to work with the numerous constituencies that comprise the university and compete for his attention. More importantly, he was fully engaged in our conversation and clearly was not just paying me lip service. Another example occurred during our most recent alumni weekend when I had goaded him and his lovely wife, Diane, to stay overnight in the dorm. He further demonstrated an ability to relate to alumni of all age and demographic groups. He wasn't just going through another necessary obligation. The interaction actually meant something to him. However, as important as that trait is, it is still not the deciding factor in what I believe makes Joel an excellent choice to be president. What did strike me as the most important qualification is when I see him speak and interact with the students. It is abundantly clear that they are the most important focus to him. That focus 
covered with the other previously cited unique and necessary qualities assure us all that the Board of Trustees got their decision right. While I mean no disrespect to Dr. Fenster, who has served the university with the utmost of distinction, I believe that Dr. Bloom's tenure will ultimately eclipse Seoul's very significant accomplishments, and I do not say this lightly. While I could probably go on for a couple of hours with you all being truly captivated with, by my each and every word, I will end here and simply congratulate Dr. Joel Bloom and pledge the complete cooperation of the alumni in moving the edge as New Jersey's only science and technology university. Joel, you have earned this role. Thanks, Joe. Dr. Mary Beth Boger, Director of the Center for Academic and Personal Enrichment, or CAPE, C-A-P-E, will now speak representing the staff. Mary Beth. So I guess we all know now, the man we're here to honor today is truly dedicated to people to students, to faculty, staff, and the community at large. And one of the most important things I think we're hearing today is that this is a man that loves NJIT. Now I'm done talking to all of you, but I want to address Dr. Bloom. <laughs> Dr. Bloom, it is my honor and pleasure to speak on behalf of the staff to congratulate you on your appointment as president of NJIT. We support your vision as NJIT continues to emerge as an institution which not only provides the edge in knowledge for our students, but is also moving the edge for the community. In our opinion, the staff, beyond any doubt, you are the right choice to take NJIT to the next level. We know that solid leadership and integrity are two of the key elements in achieving this task, and you certainly hold those vital traits. Now, you're probably wondering how I know all of this. At my request, I had the opportunity of speaking of a number of my colleagues, and they were kind enough to share with me some of their thoughts about you. And I want you to know that there were many sentiments of support, encouragement, and some rather delightful anecdotes. However, one of the consistent themes in sharing of thoughts was your ability to combine high expectations with a supportive and nurturing approach that allows everyone to meet those expectations. That's another way of saying you're demanding, but they like working for you. <laughs> and there, as an example, there are times when projects and deadlines require some of your staff to work over weekends almost 24-7. and each and every one of them said that after the large project was met, the deadline was met, that you always said thank you. That's what all bosses should do. However, there were t a time that was shared with me that you even went one step further and you presented them with a letter of appreciation for their dedication. And this act meant a lot to your staff. And despite how intense the job can get and how busy the things can get, it was clear to me that under your leadership, they would do it again. Your passion is a true motivation for your team. Now, there were many thoughts of this nature, and it was a challenge to limit so many wonderful thoughts to the moment I have today. But for me, each anecdote, reflection shared was a direct indication of your leadership and integrity. So in summary, this is what we know about you. You are going to be who you are, say what you mean, do what you say what you will do, and most importantly, we know that you will not only talk the talk, but also walk the walk. Your style of leadership is described as caring, passionate, 
open-minded, and most importantly, you're a motivator to your team to get the job done. And this style has brought forth a vibrancy of enthusiasm among the staff. We are excited and pleased to work under your leadership. We, the staff, promise to stand by you as you continue to build academic, staff development, and support programs. So in closing, Dr. Bloom, we thank you for your leadership to this point. Now, this is a little before my time, and I've been warned I'm not allowed to sing today, but I'm going to borrow something from the OJs. And in the words of Gerald Levert, we want you to know we are the wind beneath your wings, and we will continue to move the edge with you in taking this university from great to greater. Again, congratulations, and thank you. Dr. Bloom, I think uh, Mayor Booker might have been wrong. Somebody was listening. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor Booker. Dr. John Shuring will now speak for the faculty, for the NJF faculty. Dr. Shuring? Dear honored guests, students, colleagues, and friends, it is my honor to represent the faculty at this auspicious event. And it gives me great personal satisfaction to welcome Dr. Joel Bloom into his new role as leader of the NJIT community. For I have always admired his acute administrative skills and good humor over the years. For certain, Joel has long been a vital part of the successes that have kept NJIT at the edge. The first time we met was around 20 years ago. I and a few other faculty members were involved in a new initiative. Our concept was exciting and innovative, but as yet not funded. We needed some help to navigate the complex web of the State Commission and the legislature. A meeting was called in Eberhard Hall. The door opened, and I was introduced to the ready smile and the able hand of Dr. Joel Bloom. Joel proceeded to apply his networking prowess and just a dash of political savvy to secure the funding. We were successful, thanks to Joel. A few years later, I was participating in Freshman Parents' Day. You know, that's the time when we, as a university, want to convey to parents that their daughters and sons are in good hands, both during class and especially after hours. Most speakers focus their talks on the research accomplishments of NJIT, something we love to talk about for sure, but that was not what the parents had come to hear. There was to be one more speaker. I looked up, and there, once again, I saw the ready smile in the able hand of Dr. Joel Bloom. Joel was batting cleanup, and boy, did he knock it out of the ballpark. In around 15 minutes, he told all about the many support services, from residence life to the commuter lounge, from peer counselors to campus security, and from student clubs to Newark sporting events. There were smiles among the parents, thanks to Joel. Sometime after that, I was invited to an event of the Honors College, which had recently been formed through the incredible generosity of Albert Dormans. At some point, the provost introduced the one person whose vision and energy were mainly responsible for creating the college. I looked up. I saw the ready smile in the able hand of Dr. Joel Bloom. 
The Albert Dorman's Honors College has been an unqualified success for our university, adding a wonderful academic dimension and tone, which is especially appreciated by us university faculty. I think you'll agree, there's definitely a pattern here. Dr. Bloom has played a vital role in many of the successes that have shaped our great institution over the last two decades. But the best is yet to come. Together, we will achieve the next level of excellence for NJIT. That is, we will move the edge. And today, as we inaugurate the leader who will take us there, I am looking up, and once again, I see the ready smile and the able hand of Dr. Joel Bloom. Congratulations, Joel. We are looking forward to working with you. Thank you, Professor Sherry. Now, Dean Erz Goshat of the College of Architecture and Design will say a few words representing the NJIT administration. Dean? <laughs> Members of the Board of Trustees, Governor Kane, Councilman Payne, no. He's not here anymore. I hope he hears my words wherever he is. President Bloom, honored guests, esteemed colleagues, alumni, staff, friends of the university, ladies and gentlemen. We're here today on this festive occasion to mark the investiture of Dr. Joel Stewart Bloom as the eighth president of NGIT. Joel and I joined NGIT at about the same time, so we've been colleagues for over 21 years. It therefore gives me particular pleasure to make a few remarks. You're all here with an invitation, and your invitation states that you're invited to an inaugural. Well, what is an inaugural? Etymologically speaking, inauguration literally means to take to the augurs. In ancient Rome, augurs were not just soothsayers, they were the soothsayers. They predicted the future by looking at omens. In particular, they studied such things as the path of certain birds, thunder and lightning, and even the entrails of animals. From these omens, the college of augurs would then divine the future. The augurs would not only predict the success of a policy, they would also opine whether or not a person appointed to a high post would be a success. Lacking a college of augurs, I took it upon myself to look for omens. On my way in today, there are a bunch of swallows flying south. I saw a splendid fall day, the sun shining upon us, and I saw my esteemed colleagues dressed up in splendid academic costumes. As a novice auger, I'm pleased to give you my findings. It appears that all this morning's omens were both auspicious and extremely encouraging. They augur well for a Bloom presidency. All of us here assembled share the conviction that higher education is crucial. Higher education is not only crucial to the future of New Jersey, but also crucial to the future of the United States. Without the properly educated, trained, and motivated workforce, we will find it difficult to compete. Education is the one determinant of our future over which we have some control. It is the one factor that can assure a bright future for the generations that will follow us. A good education is still the best way to ensure success. Charles Schultz, the creator of Peanuts, probably put it best when he said, a good education is important, almost as important as a pushy mother. 
I was racking my brain trying to find an apt analogy for the presidency of NGIT. I considered San Sebastian pierced by arrows coming in various directions, but I thought the saint was a bit of a reach. I also considered driving a bus with 48 steering wheels, I dismissed that, or dancing with eels, I also dismissed that, and then I remembered that years ago, I saw an extraordinary juggler. He simultaneously juggled a chainsaw, a teacup, a bowling pin, and a banana. He had all these incongruent uh, objects twirling through the air at the same time. What was even more amazing is that he caught all of them without apparent effort or injury to himself. It was mesmerizing. It was absolutely magical. Why is this an apt analogy for the presidency of NGIT? I believe there are at least five key things that any university president has to juggle at this point in time. One, globalization. Although the idea of a global reach is attractive to all of us, however, the idea of global com competition is quite daunting. Two, government support. Particularly for state universities, government support is waning. Three, the challenge of legitimizing higher education. Today, many questions are being asked about the value proposition offered by universities. Four, demographics. We reached the peak of the college-bound population in 2007. That means that ever since, the number of high school students is gradually declining. It also means that today's universities can only grow by luring students away from another university. In other words, we can characterize our situation as Darwinian or survival of the fittest. Five, teaching and learning. The traditional model of university teaching and learning is under scrutiny. Authoritative knowledge delivered by authoritative figures no longer has the currency it used to have. New teaching methods and modalities are needed to effectively deal with and capture the imagination of a new species of students. These issues are all weighty and important. Moreover, our response to these issues will position NGIT for a long time to come. We are at a critical juncture. Under the leadership of President Bloom, we are poised to formulate an informed response. We are poised to lay the intellectual foundations for yet another metamorphosis of NGIT. Today is also the day to reflect why we are all here. It is a day for all of us to recommit ourselves to NGIT and its ambitious agenda. Today is the day to ask the question, what can I do to make NGIT all it can be? What can I do to make NGIT to be among the leading state universities in the country? I believe that NGIT is not so much about the kind of student we take in, but about what kind of student we turn out. We're about making the impossible possible. We change lives. Well, Joel, you have my support and that of my colleagues in the administration. We look forward to working with you as you take on the difficult challenge of not just being president of NGIT, but being a great president of NGIT. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Gushat. I've known Joel myself for some 15 years, and as I mentioned, I've had the pleasure of working with him as uh, chairman of the Albert Dorman Honors College Board of Visitors, and more recently as the co-chair of NJIT Next, which is the campaign that'll provide support vital for realizing the vision of NJIT's future 
that Joel shares with his colleagues at this great university. Working with Joel has been a personally enriching experience for me. He's passionate about NJIT. He's passionate about the students. He shows dedication that's really clearly confirmed by his leadership skills. I mean, I think of him as someone who finds consensus of common interests and is able to bring people together and touches people in a bit of a different way, especially when he brings the students together with the people who have gone before them. And there's the paying it forward construct that he's able to set up. Uh, you know, as we've heard about his background as founding dean of Albert Dorman Honors College and as vice president for academic and student affairs and services. But I've found that Joel's also a pragmatist. Uh, I know he'll blush at this, but I, I think of him in a way where he's sophisticated and, and he's a very efficient advocate for NJIT, especially in these challenging economic times. He, he knows how to develop winning strategies. I think he's forward-looking. I think he's realistic. He's highly responsive. And these are traits that I think we want in a leader and traits that Joel has demonstrated that have put him in a position to be the leader for us going forward into the future. I think these are the kinds of qualities that we all look to each other to have. And we now proceed to the official installation ceremony. The world is undergoing a major reboot. I don't care what industry you're in, whether you're in financial, or whether you're in government, or in education, the way you did things has to change. We all know in this country, in fact, we can see it right now, that the most in-demand jobs are in the, the STEM subjects. Innovation, technology, expanding opportunity, it's in the STEM subjects. It's about science, it's about technology, it's about all these subjects coming together to create the kind of future and create the kind of jobs which this country needs. Cranking out people that have the skill sets that we can hire is going to be the difference between us being successful, not only as a company, but also as a nation. This tremendous foreign competition was there before. We can't make excuses. There is an urgency now because America is actually falling behind. In JIT, an institution like that is absolutely essential. And that's where the discovery is going to be made. That's where the professors are going to get together. That's where business is going to combine with industry. That's where a lot of things are going to happen. Energy, ecology, sustainability, healthcare. Those issues are going to be with us long into the next millennium. And those issues will never be solved, but they will require constant innovation, constant research, constant study. And that's a great place for universities to play with business. As a mayor of a big city in America, this is what I want to see happen in my city, in my state, and in my country, is that we create environments that are going to nurture that excellence uh, in science, technology, engineering, and math. As a technology school, we teach students how to be problem solvers. It's not necessarily just the skills, but it's how to acquire new skills and to have this lifelong learning passion. Many times I'm at an airport or somewhere, and someone will ask, well, where did you go to school and what did you do? And, and when I say I'm a mechanical engineer from a uh, school in Newark, New Jersey, New Jersey Institute of Technology, they, they say, and you're doing this? You're trying to get these HIV meds into developing countries? And I say, yes, because um, that is, that's what I love doing, and I solve problems, and that is what engineers do. They solve problems. We strongly believe that students need that direct, hands-on research and industry experience. This summer, I'm working for Capital One through NJIT. And I know numerous students that have worked for countless companies, and some of the companies even started out here. They started in business incubators, you know, up the street from, from where we dorm. NJIT is important to me because it's entrepreneurial. Not only is it a technological research university, it actually creates things that are used in the marketplace. Right now we have about $100 million in research activity ongoing and 90 incubator companies that have been generated by the activities of the university. We don't need institutions to be ivory towers anymore. We need them to be highways, arteries. We need them to be connective tissue uh, that bring it all together and actually get it done. The leadership of NJIT has fostered a collaborative approach 
collaborative approach means people work together. When we think of this notion of crowdsourcing, what we've discovered is that the more diverse the crowds are, the more intelligent they are. So here is NJIT saying that, you know what, genius is equally distributed, whether it's in Indian communities, whether it's in African American communities, there's genius uh, 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 sprinkled all over there. And this institution, unlike any in the country, is gonna create real pathways, mining that genius, and, and, and bringing it and delivering it into the world. When I was back for my 30th reunion, what a difference. First of all, now there are multiple colleges in addition to Newark College of Engineering. It's really not the same school that we all went to, the folks that are in my generation went to. It's a much different, more fully diversified university. We need to be able to attract high quality students, faculty, and staff. And you can't do that if you just focus on the great things we offer inside the classroom. You have to also be able to provide a high quality of life outside the classroom. The more sporting events, activities, the more that people will stick around. And the more that students stick around, the more that they get involved. There is a value to a campus to have that Division I sports there. Students take more ownership of their university and their campus because of the pride that they get from watching their co-students compete. The larger Campus Gateway Project is actually a 10-year, billion-dollar community and economic development initiative. And the Warren Street Village Project that we broke ground on in March is really phase one. Warren Street Village is a physical manifestation of bringing people together and bringing unlikely people together. I mean, it really is about bringing the Greek community and the Honors College community together in a shared living environment. 217,000 square feet. We're gonna have 600 beds. We're increasing the number of kids who are living on campus by 35%. NJIT is taking a master developer role for a part of the city, and I think it really shows leadership. This is the kind of uh, trailblazing model that NJIT has been in the city of Newark. It's a true partner and has made Newark the biggest college town in the state and one of the biggest college towns in the Northeast. Close to 40% of our undergraduates are the first to receive a college degree in their family. With immigrant parents and as an immigrant, I could not have even afforded NJIT if it weren't for public funding. The reason that I came to NJIT personally was because it was the highest quality education for the most affordable price. I think of where we are at NJIT today as being a place where we're at a launching pad moment. Now that we've set the edge and, and we know, you know kind of what we're going towards, we can go ahead and move that and we can push that boundary. Those companies and countries that are doing the best are the ones that are really focusing on how to build public-private partnerships outside of their companies. We need to link NGIT to Gilead Sciences. They need to be linked to Apple and Google on the West Coast. As faculty, we need to do even more grant writing, and we also need to look towards other foundations and possible donors to help build our research efforts here. We've been cutting funds for higher education for a quarter of a century. Every year, the budget's a little bit less for higher education. When you take that cumulatively, it's devastating. So what you have to do is you have to replace those funds. Now for a while, they replace them with tuition. As you get tuition so high, the students can't pay it anymore. To be truly successful, the university cannot just connect with the government for funding. They have to be integrated into the business cycle, into the business community. If you want to make an investment in this day and age, you want a return on that investment. Uh, and so NJIT is like better than a blue chip stock. If you make that investment at a public institution, you double your return on that investment because not only do you get the research in the technology that you want, but you get graduates that are now qualified to take that a step further. We are an idea economy now. Uh, we are a technical economy now. Uh, we are an economy of innovation. And, and so the place I know that's the center of that in, in New Jersey, frankly, and one of the centers of that in our nation is NJIT. When you've got a great faculty and a great president, nothing can stop that university from achieving great things. 
And that is what I hope for the future of NJIT under this president and this faculty. Dr. Joel Stewart Bloom will now be installed as the eighth president of the university. At this time, it's my privilege to call upon the New Jersey Institute of Technology Board of Trustees Chair Kathleen Wolkopowski and Chair-elect Steve DePama. Thank you, Steve. Will all the trustees of the university please rise? The Board of Trustees of New Jersey Institute of Technology has chosen Dr. Joel Stewart Bloom as the eighth president of the institution. We shall now proceed with the investiture. Dr. Bloom, will you please rise? The presidential medallion is a symbol of the office and authority of the president of the university. Dr. Joel Stewart Bloom, as a sign of your authority, I bestow upon you this presidential medallion, which shall serve as the symbol of your office. The mace signifies the, the authority invested in the president by the Board of Trustees. With the bestowing of the medallion and the transfer of the mace, Assumption of presidential authority by Joel Stewart Bloom as eighth president of the New Jersey Institute of Technology is now complete. Congratulations, Dr. Bloom. Dr. Diane Bloom, the new First Lady of NJIT, escorted by her son Ian, please come up forward. Please be seated, except for the trustees except for the trustees. <laughs> it is a privilege to speak this morning unanimously on behalf of the Board of Trustees who stands with me and for the entire NJIT community. Those of us who've known Dr. Joel Bloom for the past 20 years have a real appreciation of his leadership and are most confident of the future. In his role as founding dean of the Honors College and vice president for academic and student affairs, he has helped to shape this university. He has worked continually to recruit the most academically talented young people to NJIT's academic programs and to create a unique educational experience that prepares them for success and leadership in today's marketplace. He is the reason many of us from industry partner here at NJIT. 
serving on boards, supporting scholarships, recruiting interns, and hiring our graduates. But there is no partner more valuable than one, our very dear First Lady, Dr. Diane Bloom. Dr. Bloom, Diane, please accept these roses as a token of our appreciation, our respect, and our admiration on behalf of the entire NJIT community. Thank you very much. I would now ask Dr. Bloom to come to the podium to deliver his inaugural remarks. Dr. Bloom. Good morning. It is my privilege and honor to greet you today as president of New Jersey Institute of Technology and to share some thoughts about the current state and the future of this great university. First, I would like especially to welcome and thank those who spoke before me. I know that much of my success is because I have had the opportunity to work with incredibly talented people. From Governor Tom Kane, I saw firsthand how the art of inclusion can achieve the intended outcomes. From Mayor Cory Booker, the brilliant articulation of a vision of an urban community rich with higher ed, higher education institutions. And from my friend Steve Cordes, the importance of priorities, a plan, and good people. My dear friend, Rochelle Hendrick, is an extremely accomplished education leader. And I don't like her. You realize it starts from K through 18. And she has done it all. So I thank you, Rochelle. And my friends on the administration and the faculty, it's just an absolute delight to work with you. I have had the opportunity to work with dedicated and highly able trustees. Kathleen Y. Kopolsky as our chair for 10 years, and chair-elect Steve De Palma, and the balance of the trustees. And our overseers, one particular overseer I would like to acknowledge, Dr. Al Dorman. Al and his wife Joan have served as friends of this university, my mentor, and have greeted my wife and I very often to great conversations and of a lot of advice over these many years as we have traveled west to California. I also want to acknowledge our very hardworking staff, one of whom many of you know, my executive assistant, Mary Jane Pohero. Many of the staff here have NJIT in their DNA and my soulmate and my love, my wife Diane, and my son Ian, those are the people who keep me going on a daily basis. I am most, most fortunate to be surrounded today by many family members, some and friends, some of whom I've known since elementary school, and of course, many of our NGIT faculty administrator, and administrators. From, from all who I learn from on a daily basis. I thank my, my many colleagues from universities and colleges that have traveled from across the state and the nation. I thank the members of the Newark Municipal Council and representatives from the New Jersey Senate and Assembly who have joined, joined us here today. These are the people who know how 
to work in a bipartisan spirit. As you heard already from the governor and from Secretary Hendricks, there's very important $750 million bond issue on the ballot. And as you've also be already been asked, please vote yes this November 6th. A little over 20 years ago, I joined NGIT to work with President Saul Fenster. I had met Saul, a powerful academician and intellect, while we served together on Governor Kane's Commission on Science and Technology. NGIT was highly attracted to me because of its focus on math and science. It is a public urban university and like many of you in the audience today, my background is very similar to that of many NGIT students. My sisters, Renee and Robin, and I were the first in our family to go to college. As undergraduates, we attended urban campuses of the City University of New York. I know some of you think this is a New England accent. It's, it's not. <laughs> After all, it's the public universities that educate 70% of the students in our nation. My wife is a graduate of the University of Minnesota, public university. Did some of her graduate work at uh, Glassboro, I, I mean Rowan, and uh, has her terminal degree from Rutgers University, another very fine school, and is currently a faculty member at Kane University. I find these urban public universities edgy, high in energy, and diverse, and many of us owe a great debt to these public universities. As you've probably already figured out, this great public university is very much at the edge as New Jersey's science and technology university. In its diversity of population, its disciplines, research, local and global community service, and the business incubation fostered by its enterprise development centers. Today, I'd like to share with you that the state of NGIT is sound. It has a record enrollment of nearly 10,000 students, including the largest freshman class of 1,049 students whose combined average SAT scores for math and reading is 1161. That's the combined average math and reading, 1161. That's 140 points higher than the national average, as well as the average in the state of New Jersey. The Albert Dorman Honors College now has nearly 700 students. These are students who are on the top 10% in the nation. Their combined average SAT scores, math and reading, is 1350. We have an educational opportunity program here that graduates students in our very, very rigorous disciplines at a rate 20% higher than the national average for minority students. That deserves a round of applause. Over the past five years, we have added 21 majors. We base these majors on feedback from the very important business and industry councils that serve us here. And I tell you today that all of these new majors, the enrollment is full. We have a record, as you've heard, of $100 million in research expenditures, placing NGIT fifth among the nation's 34 polytechnic universities. NGIT has achieved the distinction of being fourth in the United States for inventions per federal research dollar and twelfth in industry support per federal research dollar. Thank you, Joe Taylor from Panasonic. Thank you.
In a recent tally, we counted 154 U.S. patents, 101, 101 are either licensed option or jointly owned with third parties. We also have 139 patents pending application, of which 56 are funded by third parties. NGIT has the management and research responsibility for the largest aperture solar telescope in the world, located in Big Bear, California. As you look around this campus, and you saw some of it in the video, we are now in the process of doing $100 million in new construction, renovation, and repair. The campus here and the campus life is very dependent upon that. You've heard a little bit about our Enterprise Development Center. It is the home of 90 companies, 800 employees, 300 students work there. This past year, they did $82 million in expenditures, $67 million of it was third party funding. So it's time to look ahead. We can't rest on our laurels. There are emerging opportunities and formidable challenges. We must think and act boldly in order to continue to claim the mantle of New Jersey's science and technology university. There is much I could say about our plans, and I know that everyone would like to hear me speak at considerable length. However, it's probably best for me to defer to the wisdom of the dissertation advisor who told an eager doctoral candidate to limit thy topic. Heeding this advice, I will focus on only three interconnected areas. Our strategic hiring plan for faculty. The quality of life on and around our campus and business and industry partnerships. I believe these three very important opportunities are our future here at NGIT, part of the future of the city of Newark, the state of New Jersey, and our nation as a whole. First, the strategic plan for hiring new faculty. This initiative is in response to the planned growth of our enrollment the expansion of our curriculum, and, and our focus on growing thematic interdisciplinary research. Great universities have great faculty. We have many of them here today with us today. And that deserves a round of applause. Thank you. As New Jersey's Science and Technology University, we must have state-of-the-art expertise in teaching and in research. Faculty who know how students learn and how to bring research into the classroom for our undergraduates as well as our graduate students. We must have faculty who lead in their labs and work across the disciplines with their colleagues. This year, because of very timely action of our board of trustees, our provost, our deans, chairs, and faculty, we recruited over 30 new faculty members, tenured, tenure track, university lecturers. We expect to add another 30 over the next two years. This will be transformative to NGIT. Some of you may have participated in the symposium yesterday presented by three of our new faculty on the topic of sustainability. And listening to those three we know we are on the path to moving the edge. Joining our current faculty, those come to NGIT, those coming to NGIT, bring knowledge and talent in three focused thematic education and research areas that will help to build the essential interdisciplinary bridges spanning sustainable systems, ubiquitous computing or digital everywhere, and the convergence of life sciences and engineering. Our strategic plan identifies these three areas as fundamental to the quality of life in the 21st century. Our commitment to sustainable systems expands the conventional boundaries 
of environmental engineering. It affirms that we must use technology to coexist with the natural environment in ways that minimize negative impact, yet also sustain our personal well-being and economic progress. Among our new faculty are individuals who edu whose education and research interest underscores the transformative synergy between the life sciences and a host of other disciplines. Experts already here in biology and clinical medicine are collaborating with colleagues in fields ranging from mathematics to every branch of engineering. These efforts promise breakthrough insights into basic physiological processes, new therapies, new pharmaceuticals, and innovative medical devices. In the third area, I hardly have to elaborate on the pervasive influence of digital technology, digital everywhere. In these fields, like the other two, the present is merely a prologue to the future. There are computing and communication technologies and applications yet to be imagined. We will imagine these innovations at NGIT and translate them into practical reality. Equally important, many of our excellent incumbent faculty are committed to mentoring and working in interdisciplinary teams with their new faculty colleagues. Collaboration that is expected to substantially increase our significant, already significant, research outcomes. The second focus is the quality of life on and in and around campus. Just yards from where we are gathered, the future is literally taking shape in the renovation of the former Central High School, building and construction on Warren Street. Historic Central High School will have the same exterior look, but inside there will be, oh, there already are new classrooms, laboratory, students' lounge. The first floor will include ample public space for exhibitions and working studios. When completed, as you already heard in the video, 2013, the Warren Street Village will add 600 additional residential beds for our campus. We will exceed 200 residential students, continuing to transform NGIT into a residential campus. A good portion of those beds will be in the new residential Albert Dorman Honors College. Only about two dozen residential honors colleges in the nation, and we are leading there as well. In our current strategic plan, we project a student body of 11,000 by 2015. A residential campus is critically important to engaging and supporting these students. This residential environment, along with our learning communities, the adaptive learning that we are now taking on, and the increase in advising that we must do, must enable us to stretch our goals in retaining our students. The goal should easily be 90% retention of freshmen and truly moving our graduation rate for a technological university well above the average in the neighborhood of 65% of those students who start here in freshmen. We will continue to look as to whether or not we want to grow our enrollment. We're undertaking a capacity study. We know the demand for these students that we graduate from this institution far exceeds the supply. So we need to make sure we are meeting at least a good part of that demand. With the help of Newark Mayor Booker and City Council President Donald Payne, as you've heard, we are the redeveloper of 20 acres along Martin Luther King Boulevard and we anticipate phase two of what we call our gateway plan to bring new amenities to what we identify as the University Heights community. The University Heights community in the city of Newark is comprised of NGIT, Rutgers Newark, University of Medicine and Dentistry, and Essex County College. When you take those four schools and the Seton Hall Law School, also located here in Newark, and you look at the major cities on the East Coast for higher education, 
Newark is number five. Obviously, New York, Washington, D.C., Boston, and Philadelphia, but there is Newark. So we know the powerhouse of higher education that is located in this community. 45,000 students, staff, and faculty. Therefore, the development of the gateway, the necessary amenities to support that kind of higher ed population. The third focus, one that we all are very passionate about, is the need to partner with business and industry. If you travel overseas in Europe, in many Asian countries, and you come across the campuses, very often you find the signage on those campus recognizes many of the high-tech companies that we're familiar with here in the United States. Those, that signage and that logo, those logos, emphasize the close, mutually beneficial links between the companies and those colleges and universities. They are partnering to advance research and commercial development in many fields. We need the same degree of academic and private sector engagement in our country. The same promotion of cooperation and positive forward-looking relationships. We must foster these relationships, one that brings intellectual and academic support from the private sector and the private sector organizations having access to the intellectual capital facilities and other unique resources of our higher ed communities. The business plan for NGIT going forward needs to change. With the identification of revenue beyond the state's contribution and that of student tuition. It is our intention that NGIT will build and benefit from such relationships. We must pursue becoming the home of a very large scale, multidisciplinary, university, industry, applied research center. This is a goal that we all must look at together, share, and figure out how we move forward. These robust applied research centers are at other great technological universities around the world. They, they create the necessary ecosystems that we talk about. Ideas, research, funding, innovation, and invention that leads to commercialization. In particular, this must be NGIT's future relationship with the seven industry clusters that you may have read about in the New Jersey Strategic Plan, the state's strategic plan for economic growth. For many decades, NGIT has had as its fourth mission element economic development. Now it is time to actualize that mission element. Together we can continue to improve educational success and student learning outcomes leading to increased retention and graduation that we must achieve. We can grow the research and apply it with industry partners together. And we can develop a campus and surrounding community that is supportive of these efforts. To assure you of our ability to do so, allow me to quote from the Middle States Accrediting Commission on Higher Education that completed their top to bottom evaluation of our university this past spring. In their report for our decennial evalu accreditation, the evaluation team wrote, the New Jersey Institute of Technology meet, meets or exceeds all 14 standards outlined in the characteristics of excellence in higher education. The New Jersey Institute of Technology is making a disproportionate impact in higher education given its means. In particular, NGIT is providing an admirable service to first and family students attending college. These students are excellent, well-trained, and graduate, and, and the graduates are highly successful after leaving this university. New Jersey's success in providing a first-class education 
a first-class college education to a diverse student body is enviable. I thank you for listening. I thank all of you who have, who, all of you, led by Dr. Charles Dees, our Vice President for, for Advancement, who have worked on this inauguration, in addition to doing your other job at about 200%. That is the commitment of the people who work here at this university every day. You are truly wonderful and, and sincerely appreciated. I thank my parents, Max and Ann Bloom. Let's pray for peace in the Middle East, and you all take care. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please remain standing for the singing of the NGIT alma mater, led by members of the Newark Boys Chorus, and please remain standing for the benediction by Dean Peter Sestero, NGIT class of 68, and member of the Board of Trustees. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, we humbly thank you for the joy of this day and the celebration of the inauguration of our new president of NJIT, Dr. Joel Stewart Bloom. We ask you to continue to shower him, and Diane, and his family with your blessings. Grant Dr. Bloom wisdom understanding, judgment, knowledge, courage, and faith in you as he exercises his duties as president. Help him to be a humble servant leader to faculty, students, parents, administrators, and all constituencies and partners of NJIT. Bless all those who attend and serve NJIT to assure the success of this great institution. All of us here extend our best wishes of gratitude, confidence, and trust to Dr. Bloom 
as he guides NJIT's next phase of history, the moving edge. And so, Dr. Bloom, we say to you, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and he be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes the inauguration of Dr. Joel Stewart Bloom, the eighth president of the New Jersey, New Jersey Institute of Technology. You are all invited to attend the inaugural reception on the campus green immediately after the conclusion of this event. Please remain standing for the recessional and remain standing until the recessional is completed. Thank you very much. Thank you.